You may know Big Ben, Trafalgar Square, and the London Eye, but do you know the Royal Crescent, Sally Lunds, and the SS Great Britain? Today, we're taking you to get curious about England's Great West Way. Here's what I'm curious about along England's Great West Way. Who blazed this path across the country and then built this ship and this bridge? What was Stonehenge built for? Where can you find a town with its own time zone and a tasty bit of English history? Why are these buildings shaped like a circle, a square, and a crescent moon? When did someone spend the night under the fish and over the water? How is this Georgian roundabout connected to Stonehenge? Who, what, where, why, when, and how? So much to be curious about along England's historic Great West Way. Just west of London is Windsor, home of Windsor Castle, which is where the royal family's last name comes from. Nearby is Runnymede, where Magna Carta was sealed in 1215. As we keep chugging along westward, we come across High Clare Castle, of course the setting for Downton Abbey. To the north is Oxford in the picturesque Cotswolds, and to the south, Salisbury, home to Salisbury Cathedral and one of the only original Magna Cartas left in the world. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us today for our special Tenant Tours live stream. We're here today to launch our new tour that we're running to this September to England, which will incorporate the Great West Way a 125 mile route between London and Bristol. On this route, you will take in some great cities, countryside and quaint chocolate box little villages. So all in all, a perfect tour, I would say. My name is Liz and I am based in Dublin, Ireland from where I look after all of the products that we book for our tenant tours travelers coming over to the UK and Ireland. Our special guest presenter, as you can see today, is the host of the PBS channel Curious Traveller Show, Christine Van Blockland, and we're going to be linking over to Christine shortly. We've been working together the past number of months on creating this tour, and finally, we're really excited to be able to share it with everybody today and officially get it launched, and hopefully you're all curious to learn more about it <laughs> as well. So the 10 night tour will start in London on the 25th of September this year. Yes, you heard right. This year is going to happen. And at four points throughout the tour, our travelers were going, are going to have the opportunity to meet with Christine and at handpicked uh, venues along the way. The tour is a small group tour and is going to be limited to 16 people. So it's going to be really comfortable. During the presentation today, we are going to be joined by some special guests from along the Great West Way, and we're really looking forward to introducing you to them. So we're going to be visiting the Roman Baths. We'll also be calling in on the SS Great Britain and Windsor Castle, to name but a few. Um, we won't see all of the areas that we're going to visit on the tour today, but all of the information is online on our website, tenanttours.com forward slash Great West Way. So you will learn all about it, and you have the link up on screen there now as well. Another thing to tell you before we get going, we have a competition as we always do with these things. So we've got five prize bundles to give away today, which will include the rough guide to the Great West Way. And thanks to the Great West Way for providing those for us. We will also have some tenant tours, travel accessories and some curious traveler gifts. To enter the competition, it's easy peasy. All you have to do is click on the link in the comments, add your email address, and you can gain extra points uh, for your entry by liking the tenant tours Facebook Facebook page, the Curious Traveller page, and by sharing the event. We don't ask you for much. So um, yeah, keep keep entering. And the competition is going to stay open until next Thursday, 27th of May. And we will announce and inform all the winners on Friday, the 28th of May. If you have any questions throughout our presentation today, please feel free to add them in the comments section. I will be keeping an eye on these and I can relay to Christine or our partners while they're on screen. I would ask, though, that if you do have a question for somebody in Bath, Bristol or Windsor to possibly ask while they are on screen, because they may have to leave the call as soon as we're finished with them. And we would really like to answer all of your questions. Um, if we don't get to it, we will find out the answer for you. And of course, we will come back to you anyway. So no worries with that. 
So without further ado, we're going to head over to Christine and learn all about her, her show, and how the idea for this tour came about. So hello, Christine. Hello, my dear friend Liz. Um, you and I have been bonding so much and having such a good time planning this tour. Um, and so I want to say hello. First of all, I think we have Patrick who's watching us um, through our Facebook page on Curious Traveler. Hi, Patrick. Hello. Um, hi, Brian. Um, and so, as you know, we we're now we're now filming season five. Curious Traveler had a little bit of a pause there with the pandemic. You know, as we all know, the whole world came to a pause. Um, but up until then, you know, we've had more than forty episodes, and a quarter of those episodes were all in the UK. And so, when it came time to for us to put together our very first in-person tour, we thought, well, what would be better than one of our favorite um, episodes, our favorite UK locations? And we love every we love everything throughout all of the UK, but we chose the Great West Way along the Great Western Railway. You can see right there because there's so much to see. Now, our typical episode would focus maybe just on one city, like just Dublin, just Paris, just London. There's nothing wrong with that. But the thing that made this episode so unique and stood out to us the most was the fact that you hop on a train in London and you know you go 125 miles out to the west and there's so much to see north of it, so much to see south of it. And Liz, as you mentioned um, on our tour, we're also going to take people slightly off of the path as well um, as to what's the yeah. historic Great West Way is. Um, but for us um, and uh, for all of our Curious Traveler viewers or for people who are watching maybe on um, different um, uh, visit Britain sites that aren't familiar with our show, the whole concept of our show is, now I love all forms of travel shows. I love all travel shows. But the thing that makes our show different, not to brag, is that we are promoting uh, lifelong learning. Um, you know, maybe maybe someone who loves a travel show or somebody who's with us right now, you were a great student in school and you've always loved learning. Maybe you didn't really pay attention in history class when you were 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. And then now as an adult, um, you go, you know what, now I really appreciate these things. Now I want to know more about why that golden mask right there, why that's important. The Roman bath, which we're going to visit in a minute. We want to know why that was so important, why that happened there. And that's the whole point of our series. We ask at the beginning, the who, what, where, why, when, and how, which our viewers will know. And we answer those who, what, where, why, when, and how by the end of the show. So now, in partnership with Wonderful Ten and Tours, which we're so thrilled to be doing, we're going to bring this episode to life with the same concept. So if you go on a tour and you join me, and I get to see you in person, which will be great, because I only get to meet viewers just through chats on Facebook and other things, I'll be there and I can take you to see my version of all of these great historic sites. And each day, we'll be giving you a list of curious questions. Now, I said as a joke, it's going to be over breakfast when you're having your coffee. I'm not going to bombard you. You don't have to do homework. But I think that's a nice way. It's a different way of traveling where I always say I can't stand if somebody goes all the way to Paris for the Eiffel Tower. They, you know, they snap a selfie and then they say, oh, I've seen it. For us, we want it to be an immersive experience for the traveler. I know that's the same with Tenet Tours. So that's kind of the long story of how um, we chose this episode and chose Tenet Tours and Visit Britain to partner with. Amazing. It's going to be great. It really will be. And along the tour, to give everybody a bit of a rundown, we will have two nights in London to start off with. The second day, we will start our trip along the Great West Way by taking the train from London to Bath, as you mentioned there. So we will have the full view along the way. We have two nights in Bath, one night in the maritime city of Bristol. Then we go on to the gorgeous Cotswolds and then to Newbury. And we finish up in Royal Windsor before departing from um, either Gatwick or uh, Heathrow airports. So it's going to be pretty special. Just that regarding the um, the episode of The Great West Way, tell us where people can still find that in the US if they want to go back and view it again. Absolutely. Um, you can see it um, online anytime on Amazon, um, Amazon Video, one of our favorite things. You can just watch it and binge watch it over and over and feel no guilt because you're actually learning something. Um, you can also see it on your local uh, PBS create TV or public television station. And the wonderful thing about um, PBS and public television is it's not only educational, but they like to air repeats, which we love, <laughs> we love. So if you, yeah. missed, if you missed it the first time around, it's going to air again, trust me, trust me. Brilliant, well, that sounds great. So how about we start our first virtual trip for today, are you ready? I am, I am. Okay. So I believe we are going to head over to the Roman city of Bath. So I'm going to hand over to uh, Christine to introduce Stephen and present this piece about Bath. 
Excellent. All right. So we're going to start with Stephen. Hi, Stephen. How are you? Uh, hi, Christine. Good to see you again. <laughs> Good to see you again. Um, we have all of our wonderful um, viewers with us who hopefully have seen the episode um, when I was able to meet you in 2019 when we filmed, if you remember that. And it was a beautiful early morning. We got up early. The steam was rising up off the baths, and it was just such a magical experience for us. Um, and we're so thrilled to have you here again today. Yes, well, the visual effects are slightly different today uh, because it's now <laughs> afternoon in summer. And uh, so you don't call the steamy effect in quite the same way. But, That's right. Um, it's, it's still good to be here. It is wonderful. Um, and I should mention that Stephen, of course, is the curator at the Roman Baths and knows everything you possibly want to know um, about the Roman Baths. So, uh, Stephen, if you don't mind, we'll kind of go through some of the general um, background and history, just in case um, some of our viewers have not been there before. So, what are the Roman Baths and why was that spot chosen? Well, um... The, uh, the Roman baths are probably the, uh, the greatest set of baths uh, to survive from the Roman Empire, certainly north of the Alps. Um, and uh, uh, one of their very special characteristics uh, is that uh, they're fed by hot water um, from natural hot springs, which uh, in Britain is quite rare because this is the only place in Britain where there are hot springs. And uh, so I think when the Romans first came to Britain, uh, which was in the first century AD, um, uh, probably they were building the baths here probably about 60 to 70 AD, something like that. And uh, so it would have um, uh, been shortly after the invasion. They were probably aware of the existence of the springs here already. Um, to other places on the continent uh, where there were some hot springs, they had also built baths in the course of their conquest of Europe. And uh, so they were doing the same thing here. What has happened is that uh, in other places, uh, uh, the uh, fortunes of history have not been so kind. And right. uh, they have not been as well preserved now as the ones we have here. And it's amazing, and, it, and we're so fortunate that, that this one has been preserved. Um, I want to go back to um, the beginning, and I remember when I met you uh, for when we were filming, you mentioned that it wasn't the Romans that first developed them. It was actually the Celts before that, and wasn't the area called Aquisulus? And kind of explain how that transition happened, which is typical in history, transition. <laughs> when the Romans came to Britain, they weren't the first people to be here. And there were already local people uh, known as the Celts. And uh, uh, they would, of course, have been very familiar with everything. And uh, we believe that uh, the hot springs, for which they had no natural explanation, um, you know, they didn't have the, um, uh, the scientific knowledge that we have today. Uh, they therefore believed that this was the work of the gods. And uh, they had identified the deity responsible. Um, and uh, this was the goddess Sulis. And we know that from inscriptions that refer to this goddess. And uh, when the Romans came and uh, basically took over, uh, then we find that the goddess Sulis um, undergoes a transformation. Right. And she becomes the goddess Sulis Minerva. Uh, Very convenient, isn't that? Sulis is now Minerva. She's our goddess. It all works out. <laughs> Yeah, it's a name very familiar to everyone. And uh, so they incorporated uh, the existing deity into theirs. So the Celtic people were happy because their deity was still recognized. And the Romans were happy because they knew they were top dogs. I love that. I love that. Now, Stephen, if you don't mind, you're actually standing in the, in the center or the main section of the bath. Tell us a little bit about what we're seeing behind you um, and, and maybe mention how maybe the lower level is Roman and the top level is Victorian. Yes, indeed. Well, uh, directly behind me, you can probably see this um, uh, in the image you're seeing. Um, you can see water, which is the great bath, the greatest of all the baths. Um, there are actually about eight or nine altogether, 
Uh, they don't all have water in today, but uh, uh, certainly this one does. Um, and everything you see there at that level, up to about the height of uh, my shoulders, um, is Roman. And uh, then when you get up above about two meters, uh, you move into structure that's been put there later. And uh, this was following the rediscovery of the Roman baths uh, uh, about uh, 130 years ago now. Um, remarkably, they had been lost completely to view. And it was rather a surprise um, uh, in the uh, 19th century when they were rediscovered and found to be uh, so great in size. Um, That's amazing. Yeah. It, 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 yeah. Sorry, go ahead. So when we look at that uh, Victorian superstructure behind us, you may see some statues. You can probably just make those out um, uh, near the top of the columns. And uh, these are representations of famous Romans uh, known to uh, Victorian people through their uh, Latin textbooks that they would have used at school, uh, who uh, would be uh, uh, well known to them from their scholastic studies and uh, so it would have had a natural resonance for people coming here to see the baths. So uh, emperors like um, Hadrian and Claudius um, and uh, Vespasian, people like this, but uh, also more obscure governors of Britain, uh, Ostorius, Scapula, Agricola, people that uh, most people are less likely to have heard of. There, so I'm, I'm envisioning um, people enjoying the baths, sort of doing the backstroke while looking up and, re and reviewing their history, looking at all the statues up there. Yeah. Um, I also see behind you, there's a beautiful uh, torch or a flame. Um, would that have been a Victorian edition or what they thought the Romans were doing? Or is that a, true to um, the, what Romans would have had? the baths would have needed would have needed illumination because as you look at them today there is no roof um, the reason for that is that uh, when they were excavated the roof was found in the bottom of the bath uh, into which it had collapsed but uh, in roman times it would have required lighting uh, however the torches you see are not original roman features they're actually vintage 1974 Oh, that's um, funny. Oh, I didn't know that. We're introduced um, as uh, a special feature uh, because the bars are let out for all kinds of social events and civic events. There are various things take place here uh, involving the local mayoralty and so on. And uh, uh, of course, at night, uh, they can actually look quite magical. And uh, with the illumination around the bars and the torches glowing, um, it can be a fantastic sight. And so in the very high, in the middle of summer, we actually open late in the evenings um, so that uh, people can come along and enjoy the evening ambiance. That's wonderful. We have a question from one of our um, viewers um, named Samantha who asks, where is the water source? Where does the water come from? Uh, well, the water comes from very close by. It actually comes um, from about, uh, I'd say, 25 meters from where I'm standing um, <laughs> in uh, that direction. Over there. Um, and I know where that is. I know where that is. <laughs> the spring where the hot water is rising up from depth um, and uh, uh, several hundred uh, meters down. Uh, it comes up and comes to the surface at about 46 degrees centigrade. Um, it does cool slightly as it comes into this huge bath behind us, uh, where it's now down to about uh, 35 or 36 degrees. But uh, if you go to a local public uh, swimming bath and uh, were to go in there, you'd probably find the temperatures about 33, something like that. Um, it would just depend on your local regulations. But uh, uh, the uh, so as it comes out of the ground, it's really far hotter than you would comfortably want to bathe in. But uh, in the large pools here that the Romans were using for bathing, it's really quite comfortable and pleasant um, and just nicely on the warm side. 
I'm so glad you mentioned that and made the comparison with our um, public schools we have today, because I, I would love people to know. So originally, the spring was used to worship gods or goddesses, but Romans used it as a bathing facility and socializing and, and just having fun, right? It was just it was just used as a recreation area. Uh, yes, there was certainly a recreational dimension to it. Um, the uh, although curiously with this one. Uh, it uh, was rather special in other ways because um, the uh, next to that hot spring, I mentioned the Celtic goddess, there was also a temple erected to her. And uh, the hot water was coming out of the ground at what was thought to be a sacred spot. So this meant that the hot water flowing through the bathing system was actually holy water. And right. Also, uh, we believe that Romans were engaging in everyday uh, leisure activities here. They would splash around and uh, um, you know go for a swim if they knew how to swim. Uh, although the bars were shallow enough so you wouldn't drown, you could stand up. Because uh, <laughs> not many people in the ancient world could very could swim. Very. Well. Oh, that's it. Yeah, that's interesting. But, um, um, the uh, yes. Yeah, so um, so it does mean that. Um, uh, the, uh, there was this religious dimension to the site as well as the uh, regular leisure activity where you might come along for a business meeting to meet uh, uh, fellow traders or businessmen or um, uh, just to meet other friends and family, something like that. Um, they were very popular but Roman baths, but most people went to the baths very democratic sort of institutions really a very democratic institution um we have a little video if elizabeth could um run that for us and um steven we're going to be able to see um the i'm calling it the gold mask of um Sulis minerva um and my favorite thing i learned from you was the cursed tablets explain to everybody what the cursed tablets were ah oh, well at that spring that I was, uh, and indeed you can see it now on screen, there it was, uh, just briefly there. Um, <clears throat> lots of objects were thrown into the goddess uh, as an act of piety, but amongst them were some rather special objects. They're small sheets of lead, or sometimes pewter, on which uh, messages had been scratched, written, and uh, they then been rolled up and these curses were then thrown into the spring uh, with a message on them to the goddess. So uh, uh, they're called curses because when you take them out of the spring and unroll them, you can see what was said. And uh, what they are doing is uh, usually asking for the goddess's help to uh, right some wrong that's befallen them. Uh, but uh, in doing that, uh, they're also um, asking uh, that the person who had, uh, is responsible for that is punished yes. and, uh, severely. So, uh, you know, poor old Dopimedes, who'd had his gloves stolen, uh, asked that uh, the person who'd stolen them should lose both his mind and his eyes. Um, I, and, I, yeah. uh, someone who had a, a bathing tunic stolen wanted uh, the, the person who had stolen it to have their entrails eaten. Um, so, uh, you know, they were just the lucky one. Yeah, so so back in that time, it wasn't exactly um, as if uh, they were saying, oh, so-and-so has to pay a, a $10 fine for something. It was, nope, <laughs> remove the entrails. You know, it, it was a little harsh, a little harsh to say the least back in those days. <laughs> yeah, so it's a very different attitude to crime and punishment in those days. Very different attitude to crime and punishment. Um, let's move back to a happier topic. Um, what I find most fascinating about uh, the Roman baths is there are different sections with different purposes. Um, can you kind of uh, tell us about the different sections there at the bath and what um, each, uh, each section, which purpose it serves? Yes, well, they are, it is a big bathhouse. And uh, so there were different things going on in different parts of it. Uh, it was based around a series of pools, but uh, there were also, in addition to the pools, a whole series of rooms that were used um, uh, for helping people to get clean. Um, and uh, uh, where you might gather, there were changing rooms, uh, there were very hot rooms, some cooler rooms, there was um, 
uh, a way in which you would move through this sequence of rooms um, that was well established. You generally start with the colder room and then go into something warmer, getting hotter and hotter. Um, uh, then at uh, some point you might have a massage. Um, the, uh, you will probably want to take time out as well. And uh, beside the great bath, there were niches where uh, we know that in at least one of them, there's some archeological evidence for a bench having been there. So people were seated around the baths in these little niches beside them. Um, and we also think another factor is that uh, because we have a lot of rooms at one end that are very similar to the rooms at the other, that uh, as a result, um, or uh, what that was reflecting was that uh, uh, it was probably separated between gender. So we think we probably had men at one end and women at the other, uh, but at the same time, because that would be possible because the bathhouse was so big. Much smaller bathhouses, if uh, they wanted to keep the sexes separate, uh, would have to have different opening times, but that probably wasn't the case here. That's fascinating, and I'm so glad you said that because one of our um, one of our loyal uh, Curious Traveler viewers, uh, Jody Hunter, just asked that question: whether the baths were co-ed or not. So thank you for answering that. Um, we have to wrap it up here, but I have one last quick funny question for you, Stephen, that I always get asked when people see this this segment: Can a visitor today go swimming in the Roman baths when they come visit you? Are they allowed to jump in and go swimming? <laughs> Um, the answer to that is no. Um, I didn't think so. <laughs> uh, there is a longer answer. Um, just down the road from here, um, about uh, 120 meters away, uh, is a brand new spa uh, that was opened. I say brand new, it was opened just over 10 years ago, um, which is uh, where you can get all the latest spa treatments using the same spa water. Uh, however, there's one critical difference, which is the water you use there comes straight from the spring and is piped. So it's clean. Oh, okay. That is in the bath behind me is exposed to the elements and anything that happens to fly across it. <laughs> <laughs> we'll leave it at that. We'll leave it at that. Um, but that's wonderful. So visitors can get inspired um, with all the history there at the Roman baths and then just mosey down the road a little bit and then go to a modern day spa bath which is really still in the same format as these ancient baths. Yes, but if you'd like to come back afterwards, we do offer um, uh, a combined ticket for um, uh, a spa treatment and uh, afternoon tea in the pump room here. Uh, oh, I can't do think of anything better. That sounds perfect. That sounds like a perfect day. All right, yeah. Stephen, thank you so much. Um, we're going to mosey down um, the rest of the Great West Way, and we thank you so much, and we'll be seeing you there in person, hopefully, with all of our uh, new friends here um, in September. Yeah, I hope so. Good to see you again. Good to see you again. Thank you again for taking the time. All right. Bye-bye. All right. Bye. All righty. I love him. I love I told you he knows the answer to it, to everything. He really does. Absolutely. Yeah. So thank you to Stephen and also to Becca there who helped in coordinating all of this for us today. So that was pretty amazing. I loved Bath. It was great. And it's a great city to walk around as well, isn't it? There's so much to see and do. Fantastic shopping. If you're into that, if you're into the literary element, you've got the Jane Austen Center. A couple of things to mention that we will do on our tour while we're in Bath, I should mention, will be a Masonic architectural walking tour, which you featured in the episode a food tour and we will have lunch at the pump room which uh, Stephen mentioned just there and we will have a private after hours visit to the Jane Austen Centre for all of the literary fans there who want to channel their inner Mr Darcy or whoever else <laughs> <laughs> like on the day. Okay, so um, I guess there's one particular person that we should talk about who made uh, quite a mark along the Great West Way before we head over to Beth at the SS Great Britain. So perhaps we should have a chat about him. Absolutely. Um, and this person, um, if it weren't for him, we wouldn't be having this tour. We wouldn't have had our episode. So the we refer to the region as the Great West Way. The train, the railway that we travel on um, is actually called the Great Western Railway. And the engineer who created that has the greatest name in the history of time. He does. Ready? <laughs> Isambard Kingdom Brunel. All right. 
So if you're born with a name like that, you know, greatness is expected of you. So he is a British engineer um, who did all sorts of amazing things. So if anybody is in London, the Thames Tunnel, which is now part of the London Underground um, or the Tube. He also was, of course, the chief engineer for the, there we go, the Great Western Railway, um, as well as many other railways around the world. Um, and if you're a train nut like me, you'll know that railway mania really started in England. Oh, and actually there behind me, you see that? That's the, well, you know this, Liz, but that's train, that's a train station behind me. That is is in Bristol and Isambard Kingdom Brunel designed that um, to look like Hampton Court Palace. So, I mean, look at that. I felt, I felt like I was at Disney World. I was like, this is too pretty to be a train station. Um, so, so Brunel designed, I shouldn't say built, other people built it, designed, engineered the Great Western Railway, which takes you from London, the 125 miles out to Bristol. That's Bristol right there with the beautiful colors for the port and all the wonderful stops in between. Once he got there, he then also created or designed the Clifton Suspension Bridge, which we may see in this clip. And also this particular ship that we're standing on in that clip, which is where we're going to live in just a few minutes. And it's a very important ship. So Bristol, if you need to look at a map, you can look at a map, um, but if you're in England, you know where Bristol is. It's a port, it's a very important port city. And in fact, uh, during this time period, when the train was being built and coming through there, it was hugely important. So giant ships like this were breaking records and going throughout the world, whether they were passenger ships or cargo ships. And this particular one um, has a certain bit of technology and engineering that nobody had done before. Um, and our buddy is in Bard Kingdom Brunel. That should be a trivia question when we're doing giveaways. Um, was the one that created it. And there's your little hint right there. Um, so that's the guy. Um, and then this ship, the SS Great Britain, that is, um, I would say probably the top site in Bristol. Wouldn't I you think say, so. Liz? Yeah. yeah. I would say it's the number one thing to see in Bristol, um, in addition to the bridge. Um, and we got all kinds of great things. Uh, do we know if our friend, um, Beth is ready to go. I think we, we chat a little bit more. We are going to try and connect with them. We were having some technical issues, okay. so um, we're going to give it a go and see um, if we can bring them in. Yay! Hello. Oh, oh, to yeah. hear me. Yay. Lovely. Fantastic. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> Hi. Welcome to Yes, it's Great Britain. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, we're so excited. Liz and I were just asking, we think, and correct us if we're wrong, but the SS Great Britain, that really is the top attraction in all of Bristol. That's the number one thing people see. You're absolutely right. We are absolutely, we are so proud to be Bristol's number one visitor attraction. Um, and we were also voted Europe's most welcoming museum. So yeah, our Aww. staff and volunteers are to credit for that. And I can attest to that when we filmed there um, in 2019 with one of your colleagues. Um, I mean, it was fantastic. We went on top of the ship. It was gorgeous. We went all inside. Um, I loved the inside, which I know we'll get to in a minute. I cracked up at, well, it, 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 that sounds cold to say, but I found it fascinating, the difference between, you know, what I was saying, the, the first class passengers and then what I'm calling steerage, but we'll chat about that in a second. Um, first, kind of give us an, I gave a little bit of an overview on who um, Brunel was, but tell us a bit about why was the ship built and which records did it break? Why is it so important um, to Bristol history? Absolutely. Yeah, sure. So the SS Great Britain was Brunel's second ship um, and it was such a significant ship. She is sort of known as the world's first great ocean liner. And this is because she was the first vessel to combine iron and steam power. Um, so previous ships were built mostly in wood and they would have paddle wheels designed. So sort of the circular wheels on either side. Um, whereas the SS Great Britain, as you can see behind me, um, she was the first iron hulled, really sturdy ocean liner with a screw propeller, which is a marvelous feat of engineering. Um, it made her stronger, it made her lighter, it made her able to carry more passengers in, an, in you know, a really luxury level. That's amazing. Where, where, in, where was her maiden voyage to and in which year was that? Absolutely. Um, so the SS Great Britain, um, she, her maiden voyage was to New York, but sadly she did have to actually stop off in Liverpool first. So Brunel's 
iconic sort of continuous route of London to New York um, was a slight hitch in the plan in that she had to um, go up to Liverpool, but the maiden voyage was as planned to New York City, the up and coming city of the time, and that was in 1843. Excellent. And that's where I am right now. Not 1843, but New York City. So I'll just, I'll just wave at you from over the pond. Over the pond. Um, and the, the story I heard, which um, correct me if I'm wrong, was um, that there was a meeting that, so Brunel had finished the, the train line. The terminus was Bristol. And they had this meeting with the shareholders and they said, okay, well, we'd love to keep going to you know America. I hear things are happening over there. What can we do? We should build a ship. And Brunel said, okay, now, is there any truth to that or is that just a really wonderful story? No, absolutely. There is actually a lot of truth to that. So the sort of story goes that Brunel, he was, you know, he was an innovative engineer and he was he he knew what people wanted. Uh, he spent a lot of time in London actually staying at what is now called the Brunel Hotel. And in that hotel, he envisioned this luxurious one ticket sort of travel route from London um, over country, over the Great Western Railway, and then over the Atlantic um, by, by ocean liner. Um, so this was his vision. Um, like I said, there was a slight hitch in the plan that at the time Liverpool was just a slightly better commercial port. Um, so it went from London to Bristol to Liverpool, and then from Liverpool to New York City. Um, it, 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 yeah, I was going to say, sadly, she didn't actually, the SS Great Britain didn't actually make that many voyages to New York City, although that was always the original plan. Um, she did actually have a disaster on her fifth voyage and she was bought by another company and they turned the focus to passenger, still a passenger ship, but to Australia. Yeah, I knew I read about the Australia voyage, um, which I want to ask you about. And then wasn't there to San Francisco as a cargo ship? Um, Absolutely. Yeah, she had yeah. a long life. She had a long life. Uh, well, she looks great for her age. She doesn't look good. She, <laughs> she, you know, she looks had fantastic. quite a facelift recently. <laughs> had a little facelift. Looks gorgeous. Um, we have another question. Said, um, how many passengers um, did the ship hold? Oh, certainly. So she so she was a passenger ship for most of her life. Um, in the original design that um, Isambar Kingdom Brunel designed, she was able to take 150 passengers. So that's both steerage and the first class passengers um, and about 50 crew as well. Um, so that was quite a small amount. But when she was a passenger ship to Australia, she was she was completely changed. So her insides and her engine was changed and she was able to take nearly up to 700 passengers. When you think about it, wow. that is a huge amount of people able to travel from Bristol to Melbourne in one go. And as I said, she was a luxury liner so you could travel in style. I want to talk uh, to you about, okay, so the thing that made it great engineering wise was this screw propeller. Um, and if Elizabeth, you could put up that same video we just had a minute ago um, and then uh, maybe Beth, you'll be able to see the. I think we have it. It's that. I mean, you can't miss it, right? It's kind of in the heart of the ship. So yeah. as we get to it, I'll point it out. But kind of explain how did it work? That and and honestly, was was Brunel the very first to think of using this in a ship of that size, or what? What was the record breaking uh, statistic about that? Sure, absolutely. So the. The tradition of the time was paddle wheels, which was very large, round, wooden sort of wheels on the side of a ship. And this was this was not as good as the later used screw propeller, because if you can imagine the ship in the water, it, it's a bit rocky on the waves. Right, Whereas right. The, the screw propeller was a fantastic idea because it was lower down on the ship. It was underneath the water and it was much more powerful. So it could propel the ship through the waves across the Atlantic. Um, Brunel was inspired to use the screw propeller by another ship. This was a navy, navy ship um, by um, a man who was also local to Bristol. Um, and his name was uh, Francis Smith. Um, and he actually used the screw propeller on the SS Archimedes, um, named after um, the- Yeah, um, the Archimedes crew, right. Yes, right. yeah. So, okay. so Brunel, okay. Brunel took a trip on this ship and thought, wow, what a brilliant idea. I want to use this. So he took the screw propeller design, he tweaked it, he had some Brunel magic to it, um, and he presented it to his board, um, to the Great Western Company, and he really convinced them to go ahead with it. Um, this was very late in the project though, so a lot of people were very, very cautious, weren't entirely enthused by it, but Brunel, he managed to convince them and it certainly paid off, because like you said, the screw propeller really is the defining characteristic of this ship. Um, it is. 
Yeah, so it was lighter, like I said, it was lower down in the hull, um, which meant, you know, it was able to go faster and we were, they were able to carry less um, coal because it required less fuel. You know, there was a lot of profits as well as comfortable, you know, comfortable experience for the passengers. Excellent. And um, we're, we're going to be patient with this video here because I want people to see it. It's, there it is. It's, is that it? There it is. Yeah, oh, there it is. There it is. Sorry, sorry, there it is. Sorry, the the so you can it's you can giant. picture the screws moving. It's absolutely huge. And it really was. It made the ship so it was a lower center of gravity for the ship. So the ship was much more stable. It was a fantastic innovation. It's amazing. Um now the important part, um, not just my curious questions here, but what can um visitors experience, whether they travel with us, which we hope they do, we want them to come and be our guests. Um, but for any visitor that comes, what can they see now? Has anything changed um, since, uh, you know, with the reopening um, after COVID? Absolutely. Yeah, well, we were absolutely thrilled to reopen on Monday. Um, and we now have both the museums open, the dry dock, which is able to go underneath the ship itself and see that propeller. Um, and on board the ship, what we've got that's brand new is some really exciting smells, you know, multi-sensory experience. We've got a bakery with fresh bread. Um, oh. We've unfortunately got a passenger vomiting just to give you that real experience. Um, and we'll also have quite an exciting feature of the Albion dockyard viewing platform. Um, so this is the dockyard next to us um, where we're, you know, we have a real life working dockyard. So we come, come next month, we will have a viewing platform to be able to allow visitors to actually witness, um, you know, the maintenance of ships coming in and will be the only museum in the world with an actual working dockyard, which is very exciting for us. Uh, I love it. Um, and I love that you guys are taking it up a notch. It's not just the sights and the sounds, but it is the smells. Um, oh, I, I, I think that's fantastic because again, just to kind of hit it home one more time, the, the part that, that, that viewers um, saw and they can experience, there's the first class, which was so elegant. And I remember those seats were kind of neat and kind of fold them forward for dancing. And then there was steerage class where you're bunking out with a bunch of strangers you don't know. And, you know, as your, as your colleague said, life happens. I mean, you know, it was not, it was not pleasant. Um, and some of the not so good bakery smells were probably down there too. But that's, but that's all part of history. And I think it's all part of the fun to learn about it. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Like you said, there was a big difference between first class. They would have had a uh, sparkling conversation with the captain. They would have had three course dinners, musical entertainments. Um, but down in steerage, if anything, I think one of the best things about this site is the rich experiences you have of these passenger stories. In steerage, you would have had very dark, very cramped bunk beds. You would have had people traveling with young families, but you also would have had people, you know, entrepreneurs, you know, people trying to make a new living and setting right across the world you know fantastic right. story to style perfect um and last but not least i want to remind um viewers that of course um the ship is there and when you're on the on the top of it you can see the water around you and you can see the port and it just sort of um um hits home again that that's how bristol made its name it became so important it was a very important port city so once you're there in that context it just the, the experience is even that much uh richer i think yes absolutely Excellent. yeah all right, Beth, thank you so much. Um, we hate to do this, but we have to leave the ship and mosey back east on our uh, virtual train and go say hi to our friends at Windsor Castle. Oh, well, thank you for coming by. It's been great thank to see you. Thank you. We really appreciate it. Thank you for taking the time. All right, goodbye. Bye. All right, now we're going to all aboard onto our uh, train for our next stop. I wish we had a little, our little cartoon train to go across the bottom. Yeah, really. yeah, yeah that would be <laughs> cool. <laughs> and the, the SS Great Britain is quite the experience to walk around. I have had the uh, opportunity to do that before. And I think they do um, something where you can climb the masts as well. You can have these extra add-on experience. Not sure that I would do it, but if I'll you do it. <laughs> Gross. Yeah, you can go for it. Yeah, whatever you like. Um, and Bristol is a fantastic city and really a great spot. And I'm delighted that we are going to spend the night there on the tour as well, because there's so much to see. It's really easy to walk around. Um, there is a huge food scene there. and They're winning awards left, right and center for food over there. And actually, maybe later you might be able to tell us about the pies. Um, I was say, so you remember how I love the pie minister. I, that's such a memorable experience. 
I do. So yeah, you Heaven. can tell us a bit about that. And um, so while we're there, we will experience some of that food scene. We will learn about the famous Bristolian son and artist Banksy, who is worldwide known now. And we will have a tour of the famous Bristol Old Vic uh, Theatre before we head off to the Cotswolds while we're there. All right, I've got one thing to do. I need to do a competition reminder. So for anybody that may have just joined us, we are running a competition and we've got five bundles to uh, give away. So the link is in the comments. If you want to click in there, you just need to add in your email, uh, share the event and like the Tenon and Curious Traveller Facebook pages. And that will remain open till next week. So for anybody re-watching the video, you still have the chance to join that as well. Um, the details for the tour are up on screen again, so you can get the full idea itinerary there again we'll keep saying that there's only 16 spaces on this tour so it is open for sale now so you need to get your inquiries into us asap and um just to fill in maybe a couple of gaps on the other areas that we are going to visit on the tour that perhaps we're not going to talk um, about today we will have two nights in the beautiful Cotswolds area, which is just fantastic and on a must see on quite a lot of people's lists. While we're there, we will visit a famous manor house that has been used for filming for TV shows like Poldark, which I believe is now quite well known in the US oh, as well. Yes. Yeah, uh, exploring some of those cute little chocolate box villages, which has got to be done when you're in that area. Some of these were used in the filming of the Father Brown TV series, which I know has also been on uh, PBS. Then we have two nights in the market town of Newbury. And from there, we'll visit Salisbury, Stonehenge and Bombay Sapphire, where we're going to learn all about the quintessential British gin, which has got to be done. And then our last stop on the tour is going to be Royal Windsor. And very shortly, Christine's going to be joined by uh, Windsor tour guide, Amanda Byrett, who I've luckily had the experience of doing a tour with before. And she's fantastic. She knows she's an official Windsor Castle tour guide. So they have to have an, a, a different badge to everybody else to be allowed guide in there. And she's just amazing. And then there, the last evening in Windsor, we'll have a farewell dinner in the fantastic Windsor Guild Hall, which is going to be quite a spectacular end to the tour, I would say. So, Christine, what are you most curious about seeing in Windsor before we head over to Amanda? I am just excited that I finally get to go. Um, for various, as we mentioned before, we filmed in England so many times, and for one reason or another, we've yet to be able to make it to Windsor Castle. So, for me, obviously, it being such a huge, you know, piece of history. I'm excited to go. Now, if the queen happened to be there and wanted to invite me inside and have tea, oh, that'd be great, but I'm not going to, you know, uh, hold my breath on that one. Um, no, I'm excited to see St. George's Chapel and also the, um, um, is it called the Royal Library? Um, with all the, uh, the Da Vinci and the Michelangelo paintings. Um, I'm a big art nerd. So for me, that's going to be fantastic. Um, so if, we're, I'm sure if, if I can see those, it will be great. <laughs> You will. I'm sure we will. Amanda can tell us more. So let's try and link up with Amanda. She's right outside Windsor Castle, I believe. There she is. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hi, Amanda. How are you? Fine, thank you. Welcome to Royal Windsor. We're on, we're on top of a hill and it's very windy. <laughs> the Royal Windy Windsor today, <laughs> but is. always beautiful, always beautiful. Um, so I would say you have the best job in the world. You get to talk about um, Windsor Castle all day and, and greet visitors. Um, how long have you been um, a certified guide there? Yeah, I've been a, a tourist guide in Windsor since 2006. So uh, I've lived in the town for nearly 40 years. So um, I know all the things that are going on. A little bit of gossip too. Oh, oh <laughs> we're, we're definitely, okay. So if the queen doesn't invite me to tea, you and I are going to tea and you're going to give me the inside scoop. That's done, sure. that's done. It must be wonderful to get to live in a town where you have a castle and not just any castle, but Windsor Castle. So I have not been there yet. I cannot wait to visit it and when we have our tour there in the fall. Um, so I just want to ask you some basic questions, if you don't mind, for maybe some of our viewers. You know, a PBS viewer, they've heard of Windsor Castle, but they may not know all the history. Let's begin with one of the most basic, which I'm sure you get asked all the time, um, perhaps. Perhaps there are some Americans who think, oh, the royal family lives in Buckingham Palace and that's it. We want to let people know there are several royal residences. So let's just start there. Uh, how does Windsor Castle fit in with the, with the many royal residences? Yeah, sure. So the Queen has three official royal um, 
residences. One is Buckingham Palace that she calls the office. One is Holyrood Palace in Edinburgh in Scotland. And then there's Windsor Castle, which she calls her home. Oh, lovely. Oh, that's you, you can't ask for anything better than that. You really can't. You really can't. Um, let's let's kind of talk about some uh, a, an unhappy recent event that was there, obviously. Um, you know, the funeral of Prince Philip. Um, were you there for, for that time? Were you there in the city? I, I saw a lot of news coverage where the residents were kind of, uh, you know, obviously with COVID restrictions, but people were outside the castle. Were you there to, um, to, to experience it in, a, in one way or another? Yeah, sure. It was um, it was a really sad uh, week here at Windsor because we always knew that one day it would happen with him being 99. But word spread literally in, in seconds here. And it was particularly sad for me because um, I walk my dog in Windsor Great Park and uh, a lot of us a lot of us do in the morning. And we would often see the, the Duke uh, on his on his carriage and he would always say hello and he would always be 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 you know really nice and um so we we miss him we miss him very much indeed of course of course um and pardon me jumping so quickly to a happier sure. topic um <laughs> um many americans um saw windsor castle before that um as the setting for the wedding of um megan and harry so how without without, without telling too many details how does a royal couple decide where they're going to get married is that they get to pick or how, how does that process work they, they get to pick so um william and, and kate chose westminster abbey um prince charles when he married diana um, chose St Paul's Cathedral Saint Paul, in right. London and the only reason he chose that was because he liked the architecture of the building and there hasn't been another royal wedding there since. Um, oh that's great, right. that's great. Right. But, but Windsor Castle uh, or St George's, if you look behind my shoulder you can see an archway and through that archway is the chapel so we're, we're not very far away from it um, and in recent years the Queen's youngest son Prince Edward has married at the chapel and then as well as Harry, the other Queen's grandchildren's uh, Princess Eugenie married there, and also Peter Phillips, the son of uh, of Princess Anne, and a few other cousins. So um, we we all get very excited in the town. <laughs> I can a, imagine when a royal wedding, and we take days to um, you know, especially if it's going to be a, a horse and carriage procession through the town. Everybody decorates their houses, and uh, it's it, it's it's great. It, it is a really fun place to live. It's it's never boring. I can imagine. Like I said, you have the greatest job in the world. Live in the greatest town in the world. Um, <laughs> So um, just as a, a basic overview, so the different sections of the castle. So um, I'm just calling it Windsor Castle, then St. George's Chapel, and is it um, uh, the Albert Memorial Chapel? I know there's a lot more to it than that. If, if you don't mind, give us kind of an overview of the different sections. Yeah, there. no problem. Um, we're just seeing one part of the, the castle now, a very small part of the castle. It's a walled castle. So um, it's, there are 15 acres of land inside the castle wow. walls. And within the castle, you have the state apartments where the Queen does her official entertaining. You have St George's Chapel. You have the barracks where the soldiers are. Um, there are 150 people who live and work inside Windsor Castle. So that's why you can see cars coming in and out uh, behind my shoulder. It, it's not the Queen. Um, and then, of course, there is the, the Queen's <laughs> private private section um, of, of the castle, which is right up at the at the top part of the castle. Oh, that would be amazing if that was my office. I just, you know, just, oh, got to go to work. Got to go to work at Windsor Castle. Um, a, a quick um, history. I know that um, it was built in 1070 by William the Conqueror, but many monarchs after that expanded it, rechanged it. How much of what a visitor can see today goes back to um, to that time yeah. period? Well, the oldest yeah. part, if you if I move around, is 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 um, up on top of the, the hill. You might just be able to it. make out. There's a, a very big round tower, um, and that is the oldest part of the castle that goes back to the late 10 hundreds. And the castle wasn't built as a palace. It was built as a defensive castle. William the Conqueror had just conquered England from France. And so what he was doing here was um, 
sort of really making sure that the Thames Valley out of London was controlled. Um, but they liked Windsor. All the, the kings and queens liked Windsor right from the start because there was a big park at the back where they could go hunting. And so every single monarch at one time or another has lived at the castle and the queen is the 39th monarch to live here. Wow. I, so I didn't know that. So then, and see, now I could talk to you all day and I'm trying to restrict my questions to what other people are interested in, but I'm going to ask my question. So um, I guess because, and I, I, I vaguely recall, so Buckingham Palace, it was Queen Victoria that sort of built that, you know, expanded on it. And so um, throughout the history of time, was Windsor Castle as prominent as what we think of Buckingham Palace is today? Did it yeah, used to be more important? Yeah. Oh, very much so. Um, Buckingham okay. Palace is Buckingham Palace is new. Um, Buckingham Palace was brand was new. Built, brand new. <laughs> <laughs> it was built in the 1760s. It's new. It's new. Uh, Windsor Castle is over 900 years old. So Windsor Castle was always a wow. very strategic point. And what's very interesting is that Windsor Castle was always a place of refuge over the centuries for monarchs from diseases such as the plague. Um, and you know what goes around comes around. And the Queen has been here at Windsor Castle uh, since the pandemic. Oh, that's, uh, see that, that part, I, that part I knew. And I think it's, it's amazing. Um, we have a little video um, that you sent over to us that we're going to show. So we're going to see a, a couple of the interiors there in certain sections. So what can a visitor see inside um, Windsor Castle and what is um, reserved just for the queen or for the royal family? Yeah. Um, so what you're looking at now are the state apartments and then there's the outside of St. George's Chapel. Um, and that's the, the view into the, into the park. And uh, you'll be able to see all of the state rooms you'll be able to, to walk around and, and see all the magnificent treasures that's the state banqueting hall there uh, and then the the chapel so um, I mean everywhere is an absolute feast for the for the eyes and um, also it uh, it may be that um, you'll also see the queen's private garden um, this year because she she is planning to go to uh, her own private home which is Balmoral in Scotland and uh, if she does then um, you'll get to see her own private garden this year. Oh, that's amazing. Um, so in, inside we've got a, a little glimpse of all the amazing art. Is what's, What is specifically in the Royal Library that's um, not in the other areas? Is that where there's certain masterpieces? The, the Royal Library sadly is not open to the public um, but within the state apartments you will see some of the Queen's uh, art collection. She has the largest art collection in the world. Um, it's it's not hers personally. She she can't take a That's Da Vinci right. <laughs> and, and go and sell it. Um, she owns it on behalf of the nation. Um, so in uh, in the State Apartments, you will see Van Dykes, Holbeins, Rubens, Canalettos, um, the most the most glorious art. And the thing is, it, it moves as well. The Queen, um, the Royal Collection, which looks after all the art moves the art around the various palaces. So um, there's always something new to see. This is fantastic. Um, a little, fun, since um, our a Curious Traveler, our show spe uh, specializes in fun little bits of trivia, tell everybody about the connection between Windsor Castle and the last name. It sounds strange to call it the last name of the royal yeah. but it is. How, yeah, how did it is. That, how did yeah, it come to be? It's the dynasty. Well, if you think you've got the, the Tudors and the Stuarts and the Hanoverians, and now That's we've got the yeah. Windsors. Um, and it was all due to the Queen's great great grandmother, Queen Victoria, because she married a German prince called Prince Albert of Saxe Coburg Gotha. And so she changed the name of the royal family um, from the Hanoverians to Saxe Coburg Gotha. And then in 1917, when uh, the First World War was being fought, the British government said to the king, the Queen's grand uh, grandfather, George V, you know, it's really not a good idea to have a German name. Uh, go away and think of a new name. And so they came up with all sorts of names that the king didn't like, the prime minister didn't like. And then one day, the king's private secretary had to come to Windsor to that big round tower up on top of the hill. And yep. he was sitting in there doing some work. And he suddenly thought, I've got it. Windsor. After the town that's been here a thousand years, after the castle that's been here a thousand years, William Shakespeare wrote The Merry Wives of Windsor. We're going to be the house of Windsor. 
I think that's fantastic. Um, you know, how, how much better is that? And of course, um, here here in the States, we have so many Anglophiles, you know, where, whether it's, it's through, you know, PBS uh, TV series, you know, Downton Abbey or Victoria or now Bridgerton, we're all hooked on it. And, um, at, and at, well, I'm sure that you, you experience that too when you have American visitors. We, you know, to us, it's such a romantic thing because we don't have a monarchy and we love it. So when we get to hear little bits like that, I think that's a perfect thing, especially for us to bring to our visitors. You're at yeah. Windsor Castle. This is their last name. This is what the queen calls her home. Yes. Um, oh, on one one last note, um, it, we think we know this, but you're the expert, so I don't know. Um, there's a fun story about um, uh, which flag you may see flying um, at a certain time that, that indicates if somebody important is at home. Yeah. Tell us yeah. about the flag. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the, the flag always flies where the Queen is in residence. So the Queen is in residence at Windsor Castle at the moment. So the flag that is flying um, from the Round Tower is called uh, the Royal Standard. And the Royal Standard is in quarters. It has the three lions of England, the standing line of Scotland and the harp of Ireland. And whenever you see the Royal Standard, you know that the Queen is in residence. If she's not here, it's the union flag that flies, the country flag, the red, white and blue one. And I can't show you the royal standard today because it's quite hilarious. Um, as I said, we are on top of a hill. It's very, very windy today. And what they're flying today is called the storm flag because it's so windy. And the storm, the storm flag is the size of a handkerchief um, because if they put up the normal royal standard, because we're right on top of a hill, remember it's a controlled point for a, a castle, you can see for 30 miles right the way round, a normal flag would just get ripped off in these winds. So everybody goes, oh, it's the storm flag. <laughs> it's the storm flag. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Well, you have been absolutely absolutely perfect for us. I love interviewing experts like you that because no matter what question I throw at you, you know the answer. So it's fantastic. Um, and I know um, our viewers and our tour guests will be excited to meet you in the fall. Um, so in the meantime, I'll keep my fingers crossed that maybe the Queen is just has a free afternoon and wants to invite us in and we'll get to say hello. But you know, that doesn't happen. Um, we're we're always so thrilled, and I, I, I would say, um, in a way, honored um, that all the members of the royal family that they do continue to keep portions of the castles and the palaces open for the general public to get to see and experience. Then everybody feels yeah. like they're all part of the same history. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's great. Thank you so much. We appreciate it, and we will see you in uh, September and October. It's a pleasure. Really look forward Excellent. to seeing you all. And bring the sun, please. We will. We will. We promise. We promise. All right. Thank you. Bye bye. All right. Bye bye. She's fantastic. She's really good. Actually, we had great excitement. Oh, we were in Windsor Castle in December of 2018 with all of the team. They all came over from the US and we had great excitement because suddenly the flag went up that the Queen was in residence and everybody was like, yay. <laughs> so that was nice. You know, that was the first time I'd experienced that. But Amanda's okay, amazing. Good. Which... That, yeah. I, Sorry. I, I, when, I when, it, I, you talk. We got a bit of uh, yeah feedback. Um, no, sorry. When Amanda was doing the tour inside, she's just fantastic. Like you said, she is a total wealth of knowledge. She knows it all, absolutely everything. So, can't wait for that and for everybody to meet her as well. So, um, I guess before we start wrapping up today, we do have a couple of thank yous that we need to do. So, I need to thank the Great West Way for providing the books for our prizes um, for today. Thank you to Catherine in Visit West and John in Visit Bristol and Visit Bath and Tara Didi and all our friends in Visit Britain for their ongoing assistance now and always. A uh, really big thanks to you, Christine, for all of your time today. It's been great working with you and we're really looking forward to running this tour in September and having everybody there on the ground in real life. It's going to be in great. In real life, good. yep. <laughs> in real life, everything in real life. You know, what is that? Great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, a big special thanks to all of our guests for joining us today. Um, you know, it's been challenging for them because they only reopened on Monday. So they're busy, they're working. Um, Amanda had to deal with uh, storms, <laughs> which she did a fantastic job on. So um, thanks to all of them and continued good luck with the reopening in tourism in the UK and everywhere, of course. So hopefully this time when everything opens, it's open for good. Um, I think we should also thank um, um, Eliz in the office in the U 
us for because we had a lot of stuff to coordinate today and she was working away in the background so thank you for all of that uh reminder the event will be i know somebody did ask about this earlier in the comments that this will go up as a video on our facebook page so you can look back on it and share it with friends and family if you like to tell them all about the tour and get them to come along as well remember 16 spaces they're going to book up fast so the bookings are open again the link is on the bottom of your screen there um, if you have any questions on the tour do let us know in the comments or you can just email us at travel at tenanttours.com and one of our specialists will come back to you so hopefully this has whet your appetite for a little visit to the beautiful great west way with us and we've added some social channels for the region in the comments as well, so you can find out more before making your decision. Um, on behalf of Tenant Tours, I want to thank you all for joining us today. And I'm going to hand over to Christine to sign us off. So I'll say bye for me. Oh, all right, bye. Thank you so much, Liz. I appreciate it. Um, I only have one quick thing to say to everybody who's watching. Thank you for joining us today. If you have any questions um, at all about anything you saw today or about the tour um, for the fall, you can uh, contact us on our Curious Traveler Facebook page or even on Tenant Tours and look at the question over to me. Um, yes, and somebody asked me this. Yes, I will actually be on the tour. I'm going with you, whether you like it or not. Um, so please join us. Um, and I'd love to see you because I only get to interact with people, especially over this last year with COVID, only get to interact with people through emails um, and through our Facebook page. I'd like to see some humans in person, some fellow curious traveler, um, and we'll have a lot of fun and you get prizes and uh, maybe even afternoon tea with the queen, hopefully. All right, signing off. Bye, guys.